All right, so today we have a look, a very brief look at uh, one of the operating limits of aircraft. This is the structural limit. Last time we looked at the operating limit from the airline point of view, the range payload diagram. Today we look at the structural limit as imposed or communicated by the VN diagram or the velocity load factor diagram. So, the contents of my presentation are as follows. We will define uh, VN diagram. We will then also define the various um, load factors that occur. There are three of them. We look at how these uh, limits on these are specified by the airworthiness agencies. We look at concepts like corner speed. Then there are certain limitations on the VN diagram from operating point of view which occur either naturally or are imposed. So that results in an operational VN diagram. And finally, we look at the effect of gusts on a VN diagram and how it changes its outer profile. So to start with, <coughs> here is a VN diagram for an actual aircraft called as the HF-24 Marut, which was uh, uh, one of India's most outstanding aircraft designed in mid 60s. This aircraft was uh, a transonic uh, aircraft and you can look up uh, on the internet to get some idea about Marut aircraft. Uh, notice that on the y axis we have NZ and on the x axis we have V which is not mentioned here. The maximum value of NZ is 9.34 okay? and then you have these lines. So each of these lines has a specific significance and a meaning. And by the end of today's uh, presentation, I hope you will be able to appreciate the meaning conveyed by all these lines. So understand that uh, such a diagram will be made available for every aircraft that is designed. Okay. So as you can see, VN diagram is essentially a graph of aircraft velocity on the x-axis and load factor on the y-axis. Now, which load factor and which velocity we have to understand that. Also, it mentions here that this diagram is as per AP 970, which is Aviation Publication 970. Uh, this was the regulatory requirement specified by the Britishers. This has now been overtaken by what is called as DEF stand, defense standards. So, this is uh, for historical reasons. The VN diagram as per a specific regulatory requirement drawn for this actual aircraft. Okay, so let us look at aircraft load factors. This is a typical aircraft which is in flight and uh, on that there are basically <coughs> four or five forces acting. There is a lift acting vertically upwards. There is weight which uh, is overcome by lift. You have side forces which could be on any side. And then you have drag which is overcome by thrust. So you can see that there are three axes, NZ is the vertical axis, Z vertical being positive upwards. You have uh, NX which is along the axis of the thrust positive forward and you have NY side force which is positive on the port side as the pilot sees on the left side. So therefore, the three load factors would be in three directions. So what is load factor? It is nothing but the ratio of the net force, not lift, ratio of the net force acting in a particular direction divided by the aircraft weight in the vertical direction. Weight is always acting vertically downwards. So no matter which load factor you take, the denominator is only weight of the aircraft. Numerator can be force in a particular direction k, so it will be nk. Okay? So, there are three kinds of load factors in general. One could have more, one could have load factor along some other direction, but you can resolve them. Principally, we talk about NX, NY and NZ. The load factors in the vertical, uh, forward and the lateral direction respectively. Okay. Now, first issue is that whatever we are discussing today, the VN diagram, it is only applicable for a very limited type of maneuvers of the aircraft. It is only applicable for symmetrical maneuvers in the vertical plane. So, can someone describe a typical maneuver which is a symmetrical maneuver and happens in the vertical plane? 
Climb is a good example. A uh, steady climb with wings horizontal would be uh, this. But climb is hardly a maneuver. Uh, accelerated climb can be a maneuver. Think of some other maneuver. A loop. A loop. A vertical loop is an example. Okay. Uh, of uh, this one. Now, why are we looking only at um, symmetrical maneuvers? Why not? Because the highest numerical value of load factors between nx, ny and nz, the highest value occurs only when you have the maneuvers in the vertical plane. In the, you know, nx and ny will remain constant in the vertical plane. So, because nz has the highest numerical value, we are concerned more about nz. However, nx and ny also are going to create loads. For example, the, the load coming because of the thrust will come on the bolts or the attachment between the engine and the body of the aircraft. Suppose there are four bolts and the thrust is 100 tons, each of them will be expected to carry 25 tons and you know assuming one of them is not working properly etc it may be more so there is considerable load in nx also but nx could be maximum value could be 2 2 and a half nz will be 9 10 12 so therefore nz is more important this is the reason why we draw the vn diagram only for nz versus the velocity not for nx and ny because they are the largest in the magnitude and if we do not pay attention, it can lead to spectral damage. Okay? But do not misunderstand that NX and NY are not important, they are less important, but they can in some cases become even more important, especially if it leads to failure. Okay, now, NZ or the vertical load factor is always proportional to square of the velocity. So, can you figure out why is it so? So, it is lift by weight lift is proportional to half rho v square, correct. So, very simple. So, n is L by w, nz is lift by w and lift is going to be half rho v square s c l, c l will be alpha into d c l by d alpha, where alpha is the angle of attack and d c l by d alpha is the slope. So, therefore, other things remaining constant, lift is proportional to v square directly. Okay. And also nz is proportional to the angle of attack. Higher the angle of attack, linearly you will have an increase in the load factor because it is proportional to angle of attack. Now, we also have a rho term there because nz is actually proportional to rho into v square, correct. So now what do we do? See, Cl I got rid by putting alpha uh, into dcl by d alpha or a naught. So nz is proportional to rho v square. So, what it means is that rho keeps changing, highest value at sea level and it keeps reducing. So, which means you must draw one VN diagram for sea level, then one more VN diagram for 10 kilometers, 20 kilometers, etc., etc. So, that means how many VN diagrams will you draw? Okay. So, how can you get rid of this and how can you draw only one VN diagram? How do you manipulate? So, I draw the VN diagram for sea level condition and then what do I do about manipulation? Yeah, so then what will you do? Will you say that at 3 kilometers velocity will reduce by so much? So, NZ will be proportionally adjusted. How will you do it? One way is rho is highest at sea level. So, you draw it for sea level and you can say that if the aircraft can withstand loads at sea level, but understand, when you saw the requirements, sometimes we said it should be able to do a supersonic turn at h equal to 9 kilometer. Sometimes we said it should do a, a sustained turn at 4 kilometer. So, requirements are given at, at different altitudes. So, you will have to draw a VN diagram for every altitude. Now, that is very cumbersome. Okay. So, one very simple thing is done. We have to eliminate this problem and we need to have one VN diagram which can be used for all operating conditions. Okay. So, any ideas how it is done, how it can be done? Think about it. Plot n by rho is plot n by rho. Okay. So, when you plot n by rho, then for every velocity you will read a corresponding n by rho. So, you will say okay, n by rho should not be more than say 3.7 or let us say 0.37. Then what will you do? 
you will say that now rho x once what did you do so much therefore you multiply by rho by rho naught okay so which means you will have to do a conversion for every operating condition this is effectively drawing different diagrams okay so is there any other way of doing it how do we know tell me one requirement is load factor 9 at 20 kilometers one requirement is load factor 7 at 6 kilometers how do you know which is more severe one of them the load factor requirement is more but the density is less in some places the density is more but load is less so are you going to check as you said it's cumbersome it's effectively doing it for it so there is a simple way of doing it and that simple way is very interesting now have you heard of a term called equivalent speed do you remember equivalent air speed eas what is eas yes at sea level at sea level okay so what you do what you do is whatever is the difference in the total and static pressure that is dynamic pressure ignoring all the compressibility and other effects that you equate to half rho v square and if you use rho 0 instead of rho then there is a corresponding speed v that speed is called as the equivalent speed so in simple english or to understand it uh, it will the equivalent air speed of the now when the aircraft is flying at some altitude say at 1 kilometer altitude it faces air at a lower density but this air at some density equal to rho 1 1 means 1 kilometer creates a dynamic pressure how much half into rho 1 into v true square actual speed square times rho 1 into half this dynamic pressure is actually felt on the pitot-static tube. So, if I say speed that corresponds to this much dynamic pressure at sea level, that speed at any altitude is called as the equivalent air speed. <laughs> so, what you do is use a pitot-static tube which is sketched here. Okay. So, for those who have forgotten, the pitot static tube contains one port on the side which senses the static pressure and there is one on the front which senses the total pressure. And the difference of these two pressures is communicated via some kind of a pressure sensing device. We do not use uh, this uh, YouTube manometer in the aircraft, it would be very messy to do that. We are normally have a Bolden pressure gauge, we, we put differential pressure on two sides of the gauge and the gauge deflects to read the value. But this is a schematic indication that the difference between the total pressure P naught and the static pressure P infinity is giving you some delta H pressure difference. That pressure difference is attained at what speed at sea level? That speed is called as the equivalent air speed at the altitude. Do you understand this concept? Okay. So now as far as the pilot is concerned, what is important is actually the equivalent air speed because we are concerned about the dynamic pressure created. <coughs> so, if we if we basically use a pitot static tube, if you use true velocity then there is a problem because true velocity uh, is going to change with every altitude. But the equivalent air speed will be same. So, what we do is uh, we use equivalent air speed in the x axis of the VN diagram. So, instead of using V, we use V equivalent. Now, this V equivalent automatically takes care because for V equal to V equivalent, rho is equal to rho 0 and rho 0 is constant, it is at a sea level value. So, by using equivalent air speed as the variable, as, as the x axis, you can eliminate variable density. So, um, Nz will be proportional to rho 0 into V e square because rho 0 into v e square is equal to rho 1 into v true square correct so if you use this if you use v equivalent on the x axis rho 1 v rho 0 being constant nz is proportional to only v equivalent square and by this way you can eliminate you can eliminate so nz will be proportional to only v equivalent square okay so this is why the x axis of vn diagram has v equivalent and uh, the y axis of the Vn diagram has Nz. So, actually speaking, it should be Nz versus 
V equivalent diagram, but that is very cumbersome to speak, so we say V n diagram. Assuming that people understand what V is used, V equivalent, what N is used, N Z. Okay. Now, as a designer, you are given some requirements by the customer, such as we saw the requirements for F16 given during the constraint analysis. And now you are asked to design the aircraft. What will be the maximum load factor you will specify or you will design the aircraft for? Will you take a high value or a low value? Given a choice. As low as possible? Do you agree? It will be as, why, why would you go for as low as possible? Lower will be the structural strength requirement, right. So, if I can get away with nz equal to 2, if I can, if I am permitted, I will design for nz equal to 2 because then I should take care of the structural strength of only twice the total weight. But if you say no, no, make it 5, then I am forced to design the aircraft for 5 times the weight. If you say no, make it 10. So then who decides this? This is not decided by the customer. Customer does not know what is safe or what is normally expected. Okay? This is decided by the airworthiness agencies. Now, in a military aircraft, of course, there is only one human being on board, one or two pilot and maybe there is a co-pilot or a tandem pilot and these people, they wear pressure G suit and they are also very experienced, highly trained, they can withstand high load factors. For them, load factor of 6, 7 is almost routine, they do not bother about it. But if you and me as passengers are subjected to NZ equal to 2, twice our weight, we will start puking. Literally, in some flights, when there is a huge disturbance and when there are vertical load factors exceeding 1.5 to 1.8, people start getting troubled. Okay. So, you uh, have to be very careful that the aircraft is not subjected to load factors more than what first the people can handle and then you look at what the structure can handle. Okay. So, high NZ means designing for higher loads. Okay. And to ensure safety and to ensure comfort of the passengers, you have to keep it low. But you cannot design it for low load factor when you expect higher load. For example, if the requirement says 6 G turn at uh, some sustained speed, you cannot say during turn somehow I will create 6 G, but let me allow only 1.5 G right now. No, uh, operating requirements are supreme within that. So, the aerodynamic agencies have given a table saying, when a designer designs an aircraft, the design is done for a particular certificate. So, if you demand that the aircraft should be certified as general aviation normal category, then whether you like it or not, NZ maximum has to be kept 2.5 to 3.8. There is a simple formula which is 2.5 plus a function of weight and that function is such that it is 0 for W equal to a small value and it is 3.8 for the highest expected value. Okay. So, I am just saying that NZ max will be not more than 3.8 and never less than 2.5 for a general aviation aircraft. This is the positive load factor, but there is also a limit on the negative load factor. Now, how do you get negative load factor? No, when you descend, you still need lift upwards. Uh, you never design the aircraft for stall and you do you do not say post stall I should be, stall is something that you do not expect to happen. What about flying inverted? Hmm? Yes, but, 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 so during certain flight situations, there could be momentarily negative load factors, there could be, okay. So, they have given, now you notice the negative values are half of the positive values negative limits are roughly half of the positive limits. Okay. Now, first question I want to ask you is under the category of types, there are three in general category. There is general aviation normal, utility and aerobatic. So, what is the meaning of these three categories? Can somebody explain? So, general aviation you know, aircraft owned by individuals or organizations for their personal use, they do not carry fair paying passengers. That is the definition of general aviation. Within that, you have normal, utility, and aerobatic. 
Okay, aerobotic you understand. So here is a pilot, an individual who owns an aircraft and he or she takes part in stunts and all these things. So they have designed an aircraft with general aviation, no passengers, but they will do all kinds of maneuvers. Obviously, they will expect high load factors. So what is meant by utility and normal? Yes, very right, very right. Utility means aircraft which are multi application oriented, they will sometimes carry only passengers, sometimes only cargo, sometimes there will be a mix. You remove some seats and you put that, that is utility. Essentially, utility, utility aircraft are used more um, for different missions compared to a normal. Normal means only passengers who normally fly from A to B, that is it. But utility means sometimes they fly with passengers, etc., etc. So, they will be subjected to higher loads. They will take off and uh, land from less prepared runways. So, they will generally get higher loads. So, it reflects in the uh, structural capacity of the maximum load factor. So, like for example, Dornier 228 is a utility aircraft. So, its NZ max has to be 4.4. You cannot design it for 2.5 and minimum will be 1.8, negative will be 1.8 and obviously aerobatics will be subjected to far more load factors, so they will be 6 and minus 3. Home built aircraft such as one our uh, team is building, they are building a home built aircraft, okay. it is of course department built but it is home built. <laughs> so that will have NZ max equal to 5 and negative equal to minus 2. And then transport category not more than 3 to 4 and minus 1 to minus 2 and then strategic bomber will be less, now you notice. Strategic bomber is lesser than tactical bomber because a strategic bomber is expected to do less number of maneuvers. It is meant for one specific target located in a specific place. It is more equipped with avionics systems, better bombs, better guidance, more range rather than doing maneuver. But tactical means go out there and see. So you will have to maneuver more. So NZ maximum is more. Okay. Designing it for angle maximum equal to 3 and 4 is not a, it is a big difference. It is like 1 times the aircraft weight extra to be carried. If it is a 100 ton aircraft, you have to design it for 100 ton more load. It makes a big difference. Designers fight with their agencies to reduce NZ max. Fighter aircraft can go from 6.5 to 9 sometimes. Most fighter aircraft that you have studied, they will have NZ max equal to 9, even 12 in some cases. Uh, but 12 would be not uh, expected in all kinds. So in other words, depending on the aircraft that you are designing and depending on the certificate you are demanding, you have to design for at least these. Yes. Uh, so when you design a bomber, do you specifically design it as a strategic bomber or a tactical bomber or do you design a generic bomber and then the mission uh, uh, dictates what it will do? No, sometimes you may have a multi-role bomber which can be used for strategic applications as well as for tactical. In that case, you design for the worst case, that is tactical. But like a Jaguar for example, it is designed to be a strategic bomber. It is it's meant, it is not meant for uh, targets like tanks or enemy. It is meant for very dedicated pipelines, reserves, depots. So what you should understand is, a strategic bomber is not expected to do lots of maneuvering, etc. It is only expected to carry precision ammunition over a long distance. It will, they will focus more on increasing range, air to air refueling, uh, more import, more, uh, more intelligent and more capable weapons and uh, uh, stealth would be a very big requirement compared to, in a tactical uh, bomber you do not care for stealth. In fact, you want to be seen. You want to be heard because you want to scare the enemy and say, do not come here, I am here. So I would like uh, a tactical bomber to have no stealth. But strategic bomber, if there is no stealth, it is inviting trouble because it will be long, much longer in enemy territory. So it has to be as far as possible. So the answer is depends on what is your target. Sometimes you may say we do not have the luxury of making one aircraft for this and one for that, we will make a multi role. In that case, you use a strategic bomber in tactical mode also. But earlier, when people were designing specialized aircraft, they were using less stringent requirements and more features. Okay? Yeah. Requirements. 
these are the requirements. I mean, <coughs> I have given typical values because I have given a range. But if you see the FAR regulations, there will be one section which will say what should be the load factor you should design for depending on your aircraft. So it is a requirement, it is not an option, it is a requirement. <coughs> All right. So let us see, now this is the VN diagram as per Federal Aviation Regulations Part 23, which is applicable for small aircraft, gen mostly general aviation aircraft. Okay. We have seen one more requirement for such aircraft, there was stalling speed not more than 61 knots. This is the same category of aircraft. So here we notice that there are these lines OA and OB. So what would be the nature of these lines? Quadratic, parabola, hyperbola, what? Why do you say it is a parabola? Proportional to V square, correct. So it is a it is proportional to V square, so it is a parabola. So OA and OB. Now OA is basically the line which connects 0, 0 to VA that is some speed at point A. Okay. Then <coughs> there is a horizontal cut on the top. On the bottom also there is a horizontal cut and then there is one taper cut on the bottom and on the top there is just a horizon, uh, there is a vertical cut at the end. So any point inside the VN diagram is a approved or acceptable operating point. Okay. So this is a parabolic curve which refers to the stalling angle of attack. So at some speed Vs you will have n equal to 1. So this Vs is called as 1g stalling speed lift equal to weight, minimum speed. So some people what they do is they cut the VN diagram vertically even at stalling speed and they say look beyond this is only temporary, is only momentary. So there is no point in uh, designing for this particular space. Okay. So it is okay, one can accept it. Okay. Then Vs is 1G stalling speed. This is very important. What is special about this point A and the speed Va? Is there anything special? This is not a structural limit, no, because um, you can fly faster than this and loads will be half row v square, there will be more. So the, the load coming will be higher than at point A. <clears throat> that is important. It is the lowest speed at which you have the highest permissible vertical load factor. So what is, what is so special about such a speed? Lowest speed at which you have the highest permissible load factor. Will it be maximum angle of attack? No, because as speed increases, angle alpha decreases. So maximum alpha will be at Vs, stall, isn't it? As speed, as speed decreases, alpha increases. So at alpha you have CR max, uh, at, 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 uh, at Vs you have alpha max actually, almost alpha max. So alpha is reducing as you go faster. So it does not correspond to the highest angle of attack. Remember we have done some calculations on turning performance. So think about it, in the turning performance we had V in the denominator for turn rate. Okay. So, if the load factor is highest, you have the highest turn rate and when V is lowest, you have the smallest turn radius. So this is a, a very interesting speed. This is a, a speed, highest NZ permissible and also the maximum lift coefficient because it is the lowest speed. Okay. So it leads to the smallest turn radius, that is tightest turn and also the fastest turn rate. So in combat, when you are flying at a condition, when your turn rate is the fastest and your radius is the smallest, that means you are at an advantage compared to the enemy. If the enemy is turning faster than you but the radius is more, 
or if the enemy is turning, uh, you know, is a smaller radius but turn rate is low, they are inferior to you. So in combat, you always want to be at the lowest speed and the fastest turn rate. So if you want to compare two aircraft, which are otherwise similar, only from the point of view of combat performance, turn performance, let us say in dog fights. So should you have a low corner speed or a high corner speed? Which aircraft would be better? Aircraft A, aircraft B. A has a lower corner speed. Assuming same engine max. Which is better? Why, why, why nobody else is answering? High corner speed. Why? No, turn rate will be the highest at corner speed. So if turn rate depends upon N. So if I can turn the same rate at a lower radius, I can quickly be behind you. So the lowest corner speed is the better. Between aircraft A and B, if A has a lower corner speed at same NZ max, then aircraft A is better. Yeah, because see, it corresponds to lower speed. So lower speed means higher CL, na? Yeah, higher angle of attack. So no, no, no. What I mentioned is that there are there are lower speeds at which alpha is higher, which is V stall. This is not V stall. Hmm. Along line O two A angle of attack is constant. It is the maximum. It is the maximum. Agreed. Okay. But when you are at a lower speed, lower than corner speed, you are no way curve. But it is the same for both. Yes. So I stand corrected. On line O A alpha max. Alpha is alpha max. Agreed. Because alpha is alpha max. Correct. Correct. So. Uh, this is an important value. So, if you want to compare two aircraft, look at their design maneuver speed or corner speed. So, this speed VA is very important. We want it to be as low as possible, keeping in mind NZ. Okay. Now, let us look at the next point. Okay. Next, these lines AD and BE are the two horizontal lines. These are externally imposed limits. These are cuts. Okay. Now, can the pilot take the aircraft beyond A? You can. But we are putting a limit because NZ max should not be exceeded. Now, this this particular there is one speed C, which is VC cruise speed. This, as you know, is a function of the wing loading. We have seen that in the previous diagram, in the previous calculations also. And then you have one speed called VD. This is the design diving speed. This is the speed at which the dynamic pressure acting on the aircraft is maximum. Beyond the dynamic pressure, the aircraft cannot take because it will structurally rupture. So, some half rho v square at which the pressure is more than what the aircraft structure can take, that speed is called as a design diving speed. So, it is assumed that you achieve that particular speed only in a power dive. You have full power, horizontal flight, you achieve v max. Now, to go faster than that, you go into a dive. So when you go into a dive, power requirements reduce, so the same power, power available increases, so you can fly faster. But velocity is increasing, so half row v square is increasing, a stage comes when you exceed the half row v square permitted, so that is called as the maximum speed. So you have to cut the VN diagram at this line, which is the maximum design diving speed. Typically this is 20 percent higher than the maximum cruise speed, typically. So this is how you draw the diagram and this lateral cut from E to D, this lateral cut is provided simply because this area of VN diagram hardly anybody will actually fly. You will never fly at such high speeds inverted. <laughs> you would not because it is a normal aircraft, it is not an aerobatic aircraft. So it is a concession. Because otherwise, you must show that any operating point in this particular figure, the aircraft can withstand the loads. So this area is like a concession. Okay, don't worry about this area. In fact, in one regulation, there is a cut on the top also, which I will show you very briefly. Okay. So if you look, if you take if you look at an actual operational VN diagram, which the which the air force can hope to achieve, it is like this. 
so they never are able to go on the top right and the bottom right because of power plant limitations. So keeping that in mind, this is called as the operational VN diagram. And by experience, remember airworthiness regulations are continuously updated based on experience. So looking at the experience of many, many aircraft, they said, okay, when this area is unattainable, then why should we specify? So they give one letter cut on top, one on the bottom. And they give you formula to estimate those cuts. For example, this is the VN diagram as per AP 970. So they say that uh, this A is equal to NZ max. For VC, there is a formula. For V there is a formula, then they give you some N2 and some N4 and N3. So N1 is maximum NZ, N2, N2 is this number, NZ at design driving speed, N3 is maximum negative NZ and N4 is a number here at design driving speed. So you plot these numbers and then you draw these, make these cuts and you say that area is not needed. So we don't need to design for that area. So that is how you get the diagram for uh, avian diagram as per AP 970. Okay. So many evidence requirements as you can see they are giving <coughs> some concessions or cuts. Okay. <coughs> let us see now. Let us see what happens now if the pilot exceeds now for some reason intentional, unintentional. The pilot wants to go outside the VN diagram. So let us see what is possible, what is not possible. Certain areas are not possible. So, for example, can you fly in this region? Why not? Because you will stall the aircraft. Before a hero tries to go there and do this, that plane will crash. So, on the left of line OA and the left of line OB, you cannot have sustained flight. You may have temporary, but not sustained. Not possible because of stall. <coughs> okay. Let us see. What about the right of this vertical line? Not possible. Not fuselage, power plant limitation. Fuselage is okay. Fuselage can take the load. Here the problem is that the power that you need to fly at speeds higher than that is not available because you have reached the maximum speed you can fly. So unless you change the power plant, you cannot exceed that area. So I would say that the left and the right of the VN diagram, they take care of themselves. It is the top and the bottom portion which is a dangerous portion because <coughs> above AD and below BE, it is not possible, oh sorry, it is possible to fly. How is it possible to fly? What do you need for that? So, so what, is, what is needed? not necessarily just climb. So you need control power. You need control power. If the aircraft is flying at a high speed and if the pilot pitches the control rapidly, it will start. Now if the aircraft has enough control power, it can go beyond vertical load factor and the structure can disintegrate. Okay. So this is not something that takes care automatically. On the right hand side, he will struggle to fly, he will give full throttle, it will not go only. On the left, he will reduce the throttle, make the aircraft speed low, 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 he will start falling before he goes on the left side. So even if he wants, the pilot cannot do this drama on the left and the right side. Top and bottom, the pilot can easily take the aircraft and that is why this is called as a checked maneuver. So <clears throat> if there is enough engine control and power, you can, but then passengers will all be half dead anyway, if there are passengers remaining by this time. And then there will be structural problem because the load on the structure is increasing. Okay. Now suppose there is a dive pull out maneuver. That means the aircraft is going into horizontal flight and then a dive. And then recovering from dive, this particular maneuver. Now if you have seen, there are some disaster videos on YouTube where they say, show some aerobatic maneuvers happening. The pilot has gone for a dive and then there is a structural failure. Yes, there are many such. So what has happened is, during this dive pull out, the load factor has exceeded the NZ max that the aircraft can take. Either because the control action was started too late or because some disturbance took place. So the structural loading increased, increased and then the structure snapped. 
So therefore, this dive pull out maneuver is always called as a checked maneuver. In the cockpit of the pilot, there is a sticker which says never exceed NZ equal to so and so number. It is there because you can exceed in during combat or during any maneuver. For example, when we did flight testing at HAL Nasik on week 27, it was very common during testing for pilots to go very near the NZ max and they say we never realized because they were busy doing other things and they, they are fighter pilots, they are used to maneuver and all that but we have to be careful. So what we do, we have a digital flight data recorder which we used to record, every flight we used to record around 27 parameters and then take a printout of that and then you know say look in this particular case with, uh, with two drop tanks you cannot exceed 4G but you have done it, you have gone to 3.9 or something like that. So then if the structure is uh, stressed beyond the limit then you have to ground the aircraft and you have to do the inspection of all those structures. So it is a very complicated thing but it can happen. So it has to be checked. So one way of doing it is in the flight control system also you have a non-linear force required so that the pilot while executing the maneuver will start feeling resistance, okay. There is a danger that that can come in way of normal combat. When you want to do that in combat momentarily, you might get restrained and that may lead to the pilot being shot down. So that is why we do not physically limit this very often but we have to caution the pilot. So by practice they have to understand. Now, <clears throat> the last thing we will see today is okay, this is fine, these are standard maneuvers which are incurred by the pilot intentionally. There are certain things which happen unintentionally because of nature, because of atmosphere and one such thing is called as a gust. So what is meant by gust? Sudden what? Lateral, there can be lateral gusts but they are very rare, they are very rare and of least concern because what will they create? They will create NY, NY I am not too much bothered. So we are concerned about vertical gusts because they will add to the load factor. So we will look at the effect of gusts. So gusts are vertical draft of air they could be upwards or downwards right and they are they cannot be seen because air is invisible so it happens suddenly but what they do is they impose these additional vertical loads load factors on the aircraft so you are in a maneuver your nz is increasing from 1 to say 2 2 and a half 3 3 4 and when you are at 4 a gust strikes can happen gust does not say no no the fellow is maneuvering do not strike let us wait for 5 seconds then we will strike, it does not happen like that. So you are at NZ equal to 4 and the gust strikes and that gust gives you delta Z equal to 2, you have gone to 6, you have crossed the limit. So that is why we have to be careful. So here is a typical aircraft in horizontal flight and now there is a vertical gust. Now gusts are hardly ever they are vertical only, okay. They may be vertical but they may, they, they may not be sharp. Okay. They always have some kind of a distribution which I will show you. But for example purposes, we can say okay, there is an aircraft flying level flight and then there is a vertical gust. Air comes and hits it vertically. So what will happen is this vertical gust, you have one V and then you have one U. So the resultant becomes vectorially at an additional angle delta alpha. So you are flying at alpha, you have some L. That, that is proportional to DCL by D alpha into alpha that is the uh, CL and so half rho V square S CL will be the lift upon W is the NZ. Now during that condition there is a vertical gust. So alpha becomes alpha plus delta alpha, L becomes L plus delta alpha, delta L. So delta NZ will be delta L by W. Okay. So, the direction of relative wind is incremented by alpha. Now it could be reduced if it is a downward gust. So downward gusts are actually beneficial. They reduce the load factor but they cause jerks and those jerks can also cause momentary stress concentration. Microbursts, okay, 
yeah, yeah, but those micro bursts during landing can cause a crash. Okay, so it is beneficial to some extent, but if there is a sudden micro burst which brings it down quite a large value, there can be a problem. Okay, so this delta N Z additional load factor, okay, it can be shown to be equal to half into rho into V E square, okay, but then you would divide it because delta N Z is basically delta L by W, so that W has to be kept that W is here. So, this delta Nz is alpha 0, this is the DCL by D alpha into rho Vg by S. And uh, if there is a aircraft in level flight, the low factor is already equal to 1, correct? In level flight, N is equal to 1, Nz is equal to 1. And now you will have vertical gust. So, the additional load factor in level flight will actually start from N equal to 1. So let us see. Now, the airworthiness authorities they say that we cannot simply assume some vertical gust velocity. They look at the data available from atmospheric um, observations and based on that they give a particular variation. Now, at low altitudes you normally see higher gust velocities, at high altitudes the gust velocities are lower because disturbances in the atmosphere are generally more at low altitude compared to high altitude. So, therefore, they give a graph like this. What is this graph? Pay attention very carefully. On the x axis you have the velocity of the vertical gust in feet per second and on the y axis you have the altitude at which you are operating. So, just to interpret this graph. This is for a sharp edged gust, okay? the gust that comes suddenly. That means there is no vertical, you are flying like this and suddenly you find some gust. So, for that, the, this, is a, this is a specification, this is not a calculation, this is what the agencies say that uh, at sea level, the gust velocities, you know, have to be taken 25 feet to 50 feet. So, at VD, design diving speed, the graph is you have to take 12.5 at 50 and 20 at uh, 25 at 20,000 feet. So, what it means is if you are flying the aircraft at 20,000 feet, you can expect a vertical gust sharp of 25 feet per second when you are flying at design diving speed and 50 feet per second when you are flying at cruising speed. These values are reduced by 50 percent at 50,000 feet and in between it is linear, okay. So, let us see exactly what the specification is. So, the specification basically is now real life gusts are never, never sharp, they always have got some distribution, normally it is a cosine distribution, okay or sometimes there is some other distribution. So, there is a standard textbook on this which talks about gust load estimation on uh, aircraft. So, this is one uh, cosine distribution as per the FAR. So, according to this particular thing, uh, the value of this C mean, what is mean? C mean is the mean geometric chord of the aircraft. So, depending on the geometric chord of the aircraft, the value of Vg can be 25. After that, you can assume a reduction like this because when you are flying at a very high speed, Okay. At that time, already you have high load factor because V is high. Yeah, speed is higher. Okay. So, at that high speed, now uh, design diving speed actually could also be in, uh, see because if you see the VN diagram, you have a possibility of flying at NZ equal to 1 and V equal to VD. Okay. So, that is the maximum speed you can attain. So, we expect, you cannot penalize an aircraft in the worst condition with the worst gust. It is like a concession. We are saying, you are flying at a low speed, assume the gust to be higher. You are flying at a very high speed, at that speed if you want to take care of heavy gust, it will be too much of over design. That is the reason why there is a concession. So, there is something called the gust elevation factor, which takes care of the fact that no gust 
is actually um, no gust is actually sharp. It is always and moreover, when gust acts on the aircraft, it doesn't uh, also reacts immediately. So there are these factors available. So for subsonic, supersonic, there is something called the mass ratio. Now I want you to just understand one important thing. Mass ratio mu is a function of wing loading on the numer numerator. Other things I can consider to be constant. Mean geometric chord is aircraft constant. A naught is constant for a given aerofoil. So if W by S is large, then mu is large. If mu is large, the value of K is large. So in other words, if you fly at low wing loading, the delta NZ is lower. That means from the gust sensitivity point of view, you should have low wing loading. So this is one more condition for or one more consideration for designing the wing loading of the aircraft. So I say that wing loading of the aircraft should be as high as possible because it gives a smaller wing and it gives you better performance. But it will compromise two things. It will compromise the takeoff and landing distance. They will become larger if you have high wing loading. And the second thing is the gust alleviation or gust response of the aircraft will be poor. So, for a passenger aircraft, sometimes the wing loading is kept low to ensure better or lesser gust uh, response. Okay. So, <clears throat> once again, from the point of view of passenger comfort, it is good to have low wing loading because at, low wing, at lower wing loadings, the response of the aircraft to the gusts is lesser. So, the reaction of the gust on the passengers or delta nz will be lower basically and we are concerned with delta nz passengers can take 1g is natural we are used to operating in 1g okay. but if you go to 1.2 1.3 1.5 it becomes dif difficult for us at 1.5 a gust strikes it may become 1.7 1.8 so if that delta nz is small it is more comfortable so in passenger aircraft, we have gust alleviation systems. They constantly deflect. If you observe, if you ever fly now on any long distance aircraft, which has got a flyer wire system, you will notice that the ailerons are never stationary. They always vibrate. Sometimes more, sometimes less, sometimes more, sometimes less, because they are responding. So what we do is we use sensors in the aircraft to sense what is the load factor coming and we start deflecting the control surfaces to create forces to overcome that. So these are, this is, so read up, this is called as a gust elevation system. Most modern transport aircraft have a very good gust elevation system. Therefore, even in disturbed weather, the passengers may not feel so disturbed. Okay. So if you want to plot the restrictions due to gust loading, you will start at the point 1, 0 because that is level flight. So at level flight, as your V increases up to Vc, you must take care of gust of 25 meter per feet per second. So the delta Nz which will come on an aircraft will be along this line. That means I am be flying at n equal to 1, but at this speed, delta Nz could take me here. As long as delta N is within this bracket, I am acceptable. If I go outside, it is considered to be unsafe. Or put it the other way, the aircraft should be designed to handle structural stability and reliability when you operate inside this envelope. This is just the gust envelope. And after Vc, because the speeds are reduced to half, the value will be reducing up to the speed Vd. So these are the lines for uh, at, at plus Vc okay, or up to the cruise speed and then there are lines up to the design gust. So these are the limit gust lines. This is the limit gust. In other words, the outer envelope should be such that inside the envelope, any operating point in the aircraft should be sufficiently strong. Now, to this, we should consider. Now, this is our typical VN diagram. This is called as a limit maneuver diagram. 
because these are limits imposed on the aircraft because of maneuvering, because of NZ, which comes because of maneuver. So, as long as you are inside this pragaf, you are safe. Anything happens and it, you go outside, it is unsafe, structurally unsafe. On this, I must superimpose these gust lines. So, now you see that if I can design, now I will never reach this area because of just a gust on horizontal flight, but at this particular speed, I may actually go here, whereas I will not be able to, I will not go here from the point of view of structure. So, now you have two diagrams which are superimposed. So, the, the yes. That you gave, you said we can't go here, so that wasn't visible. Again. Which one? Ah, oh, this color is not visible. Sorry. So, basically, what is happening is uh, there is a there is a line which goes from here. From here, this is okay. From 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 uh, v equal to zero and uh, nz equal to one. That is where the lines originate. Okay, I will just show you. You can see this diagram. This diagram is clear. So, in this diagram, superimpose this diagram on the previous VN diagram. This is the limit gust diagram. We have to superimpose this on the limit maneuver diagram. That superimposition is this. So, when you superimpose, then uh, unfortunately it is not clear there. What will happen is I can write here, I can write here and show it to you. So, let us assume this is our axis. So, here we have the V equivalent and here we have NZ. So, one diagram that we got was this diagram, a parabolic line, another parabolic line, horizontal line, horizontal line and maybe one cut here and one cut here. So, this diagram is our diagram because of maneuvers, symmetrical maneuver in the vertical plane. Okay. On this, if I want to superimpose now, there was this point 1 comma 0. So, from there, there was one line which went like this and then it and then it came down like this up to VD. And similarly, there was a line which went like this and then came like this. So, this is our limit gust diagram. So, the body, the, the diagram will be amended finally like this. So, this area anyway is infeasible because on the left of this line you cannot fly. So, I am not talking about this area, but what will happen now is that I will I will have to take care of, so let us say this is the V stall, this is NZ equal to, actually it will be this, this is N equal to 1. So, this will be the vertical line, because at this point N equal to 1. That is where the gust line start. So, this area is infeasible. You cannot be here. Therefore, my diagram will now become like this. It will start from here, go here and then there will be some additional area. this will become now my, this will become now my visible VN diagram. So, I have to now ensure that anywhere inside these double lines, the aircraft should be able to withstand the structural loading. So, this is how you can superimpose the two diagrams, okay. Is it clear? What should be inside the ghost diagram? See, the feasible region is inside the double red lines. These, the limit could be created or additional area to be considered could come 
either because of gust acting in horizontal flight which takes it beyond the maneuver limit or the maneuver limit whichever is more. So, it is like saying this area is feasible and then there is an intersection of some other area which is slightly more at some places. So, that together it will be the super set of both of them. The reason is that for example, this area, this area you cannot go to this area by maneuvers because you are under equal to max specified. But unfortunately, unfortunately uh, at this speed there could be a gust so that the delta nz takes you from sorry at this speed because this is level flight. So, you are flying at n equal to 1 and v equal to this velocity. So, your n nz is equal to 1 and v is equal to some v that is its v c r a this is v c r a. So, when you are at this point so much gust delta nz may be created. So, it will take you outside the VN diagram. So, this is one reason why you will notice many times aerobatic maneuvers or air shows are cancelled in the last minute when the weather is very bad. People feel offended and say what happened, somebody developed cold feet, it is not this, it is this. Because if you are aware that there is going to be disturbed weather, there can be gusts acting, then during maneuver there may be a gust acting and taking you beyond the envelope and causing structural damage. So, during bad weather many a times the, um, the air shows are cancelled. Okay. All right. So, with that we come to the end of uh, the VN diagram. Today we have finished little bit early, so it is good.